All right, we're back. It's another Carolina podcast. Last one of the regular season. We're all thrilled to be here. Um, no, I'm just kidding. I'm in a super mood this week. I love Thanksgiving. We have a Thanksgiving feast sitting right outside of the door of the studio right now. Uh, Wes, did you partake before we came in here? In not any capacity? yet. Not yet. Yeah, I'm about, just... I'm, that's one of the shows going to be like 15 minutes this yeah. time. Well, not only were you eyeballing it, I think you even like touched some of the food because you were Don't so excited and that, you, yes. you resisted. Yeah, so well, they'll listen after the fact and they won't be able to do anything about True. it. True. Um, but seriously, like the Carolina Clemson game is going to be the worst Carolina Clemson game I've ever watched in my life. And I'm not in a bad mood about it, which I think is good. And I think will help us have a lively discussion today, including our final buy or sell of the football season. Bittersweet, um, even though I think I've dominated. So I'm, I'm happy that it's drawing to a close. Have you? I don't know. Mm, I'm not keeping unofficial. score. Mm. Are y'all keeping score? <laughs> so you can't tell me that I haven't dominated. I don't think you've dominated. Are you sure? No, I think it's been close. Okay, I think I've dominated. I haven't That's kept the final it word. Maybe one of our listeners has been keeping track of this because we sure have not. Um, but we'll, before we get into buy or sell, we'll just do big picture thoughts about the Clemson game. Why should anybody go to or watch this game? That's a good way to start. Um, Seriously, like, why? Well, I, I will say this. I'm not going. The last time that you were this sure South Carolina had no chance to win a football game. It was the George game, man. It was the George game. Okay. All right, so, cool. So Wes is already predicting an upset. Mark it down. No. One minute uh, and 32 seconds into the podcast. <laughs> no, I, I mean, why, why should they go? Um, I think it's pretty simple. If you're a South Carolina fan... You've been you've been through this crap before, you know. You've been through a down season. You've been through um, worse seasons, actually. Uh, I would say for the seniors, for the fact that if you go to the games, you're probably going to go to the game anyway. Um, it's what you do. I respect it, and um, you know, so that you don't let Clemson completely take over your football stadium mm-hmm. as well with um, you know senior, junior, and sophomore prospects sitting. They're watching as well. The uh, you kind of you got to protect your your building, I, I think, and that's why you go and you, you go just for the off chance that you could witness the best upset you know in, in school history. I, I say that's that's why you go because the other one happened earlier this year. So why not just do it twice in one year? Why not have the biggest upset in school history and then do it again two months later? I mean, I think I, I agree with you, and I, I said. This week on my local show, I said yesterday on my Get Cocky podcast when Will Helms and I were trying to figure out, you know, kind of what to watch for in this game. We went through some kind of football storylines, but more than anything else, uh, like I'm, I'm being negative because it's really easy for me to play the foil to y'all's general positivity. But in all seriousness, like this is one of the great things about college football. Like win or lose, this rivalry exists because it's fun and because there's actual good natured, for the most part, animosity between these two schools between fans of the schools between students athletes and it's a lot of fun and it's a lot of energy and i'm not going but it's not because i'm so fatalistic about the game i just well it doesn't matter why i'm not going but it has nothing to do with like the football part of it so i I think i hope that carolina fans show up i hope that by the end of the game it's not mostly clemson fans although i am worried that that will be the reality chris what's your take on why people should go to the game yeah, I mean, I, I think anything – look, nobody's favoring South Carolina. I don't think any of us believe that South Carolina is going to win. Uh, and and I think all of us – well, I'll speak for myself. I think I'll agree that there are concerns about whether or not this game will be competitive because of South Carolina's lack of being able to score points. Concerns is a way to put it, yes. Right. So, so um, e- even given all that, I mean, you go to a football game because, you know, it's a rivalry game. You go, like Wes said – Fans have set through bad. I mean, uh, the 63-17 game, very bad. You know, the first Will Muschamp game, 56-7, to bad. You know, uh, even last year, it was a more it was definitely a tolerable game for fans because South Carolina was able to score points and put up points on Clemson like we've rarely seen in the past several years. It wasn't the best offensive performance against Clemson during that time span in terms of point production, but it was close. And certainly with what they did through the air and things of that nature. Um, but even then, it was a miserable experience in some regard because Clemson just went right up and down the field offensively. And South Carolina's defense was a mash unit at that time. So, I mean, th- there's been bad in this rivalry. You never know. I mean, you absolutely never know what's going to happen. Nobody's picking an upset here, at least among our little group. Um, we haven't asked Wes yet. 
We haven't asked Wes. No, Actually, we did ask no, Wes, and he said on the record that he thinks it's going to be an upset. That's so. right. I forgot. Yeah, that's right. So, but, but, but no, you I, and I, I are mean, not picking an upset. No, we're not. And, and I mean, you ju- you just go. I mean, you go because you're a college football fan. It's the final game, game of the year. Final, final game, game of the year. You go. You see what happens. The and social that's activity. It. Yeah. Have some beverages. Yeah. Enjoy it. Yeah, yeah, dude. Capri Suns are still good. Apparently, I found that out recently. Uh, hang on. One thing that I will say though, not to I guess encourage people not to go because again, I think people should go because that is like fundamentally the purpose of this thing and it's the entertainment and it's meant to be experienced. So go experience it. But when you talk about last year being a pretty significant beatdown, like you said, Clemson just kind of did what they wanted at will. I, I think the entertainment value of that game was high because, as you mentioned, there was at least a lot of scoring. I think this game, and I talked about this a lot yesterday on my podcast, uh, my Get Cocky podcast, the fact that the line is as big as it is and the over-under is as low as it is, I think portends a game that is not only going to be a beatdown but also going to be kind of boring. Like Vegas, I think, is is predicting this to be about a... They're actually predicting it to be like a 38.5 to 12.5 kind of game, but I could totally see this being like 48 to 3, in which case, just the... Even for an objective observer, there's not much entertainment value in the game, unfortunately. And that's kind of like how all of Clemson's season has gone, with the exception of A&M a little bit and North Carolina. Everything else has been kind of boring. Yeah, and I think the thing with the game last year that was interesting is... You know, South Carolina came out guns blazing. Um, offense had its best, you know, performance of the year. I, I think that was Brian McClendon's best moment as South Carolina's play caller. Um, they came out to prove a point, and the thing about that game is, even Clemson did. You know, even though they did win by twenty-one points, um, you know, there there was a late score that was tacked on, and you had the sense or at least I did, throughout that game, the way South Carolina's offense was playing was if Clemson would just mess up once or twice and, you know, throw an interception. If something crazy happens, you get that key turnover, then maybe, just maybe, South Carolina has a chance in this game because the offense was going up and down the field and and really did against that defense what no other team did last year. Um, including like even Alabama in the national championship game. <clears throat> yeah, and I, I think that game really opened Clemson's eyes a bit, you know, exposed them ahead of time to where they could then adjust, buckle down, and, um, you know, go into the rest of their season with some adjustments. The problem with all of what I just said is that, A, Clemson has all that on film from last year. You're not going to catch them off guard again. B, um, different quarterback for South Carolina, no Debo Samuel, Brian Edwards is questionable. Um, Kiel Pollard had a huge game. He's not able to play. Um, Three of the four receiving targets that really hurt Clemson last year are likely not available for the Gamecocks. So the chance of just South Carolina repeating that offensive performance, um, likely not in the cards. So... That uh, that really, I, I think, hurts you. But what's interesting, because this year's team and last year's team are kind of like Jekyll and Hyde of each other in some ways. Obviously, the offense was explosive, did what they did against Clemson, and the defense was a disaster, not just because they were a disaster, because they were walking wounded and playing guys that literally didn't have bios in the media program because that's how, how much it was a guarantee that they weren't going to have to play. But it's kind of the flip side this year where the defense mm. has been good. They've given up points, but I'm, we talked about this last week. Carolina didn't really give up 30 points defensively against AM. Like you blame the offense for a lot of those points because they put the position, they put the defense in a position where they had to be on the field for 83 plays. The offense just couldn't get first downs. They couldn't, you know, I, I put a lot of that on the offense. The defense has been a lot better. They played a lot better in that game than the 30 points they gave up. The defensive line's really good. The pass rush has been good. They've been good defending the run. The linebacking play has improved. The secondary, while they don't have any depth and the safety play is still a question mark, I think the corners have been good, and J.C. Horn's had a really strong second half of the season. So it's kind of the inverse, and then the offense has been completely anemic, and I think it's probably fair to say the offense this year has been as bad as the defense down the stretch last year. So with that being said, with those things flip-flopped, do you expect Carolina to similarly keep the game close but doing it in the opposite way? I think that's the – if if you go into every game um, saying – what what's the blueprint? As in, um, what has to happen or what can what is in the realm of possibilities that's at least and without having to go into the anything can happen in college football 
realm in that any team could literally beat another team one time out of like a thousand chances. Yeah, if, or you, if you turn it over eleven times, and if yeah. for some reason the entire team gets dysentery before the game, like yeah, like if you without going into that realm, what has to happen for South Carolina to win? And I think, I mean, I think you're on it. It this has to be South Carolina's best defensive performance of the year. Um, Clemson has to maybe take this defense a little bit lightly, thinking it's going to be easy, and then get in there and oh, well, we're not running the football as easily as as we thought we were going to. Uh, defensive line stands up, maybe get some pressure on Trevor Lawrence, forces uh, you know some errant throws. Clemson maybe helps you out a little bit and and miss. You know the thing about last year, their guys were so open, like it was just pitch and catch. Um, like Clemson. Clemson was only stopping themselves. South Carolina was not stopping mm-hmm. Clemson at all last year. It, it won't be the same as that this year, but can – is there like that give and take where the offense does just enough and the defense um, has their best game of the year, Clemson does enough wrong, uh, Carolina wins turnover battle, Clemson kicks field goals, South Carolina scores touchdowns. Is there is there just enough of all those things that can give South Carolina a chance? To me, I you know I, I don't expect the defense to be able to do that and hold up against what is a really really talented offense at about every position. That's the thing about Clemson; you can't just take away. Oh, if we take away this guy, hmm. um, well, they have the best receiving core. If you you know play two safeties back, we're not going to let them beat us down the field. Um, well, they'll just run the ball to death or hit you with the perimeter screen game. To you know they they do everything pretty well, and they have a good offensive line. And hey, the quarterback he's an NFL prospect as well. So um, the the thing is, it, it's hard to see the blueprint. I'm sure it's there, but the percentages of it hitting are are, are at least according to ESPN FPI like eight percent. Yeah. And, well, uh, and I'm mostly talking about a blueprint to cover because I mean, if we're if we're going to talk about blueprint for upsetting, like we're we're going to have to talk about Clemson turning it over eleven times and the entire Clemson the, football team getting dysentery. Like those are the things we're going to have to talk about. I'm talking about covering, keeping it close. It was a you know fourteen point game midway through the fourth quarter. Finished a twenty one point game. What does Carolina need to do to replicate that? Um, and, and your estimation is uh, it sounds like you think that's unlikely to happen in terms of what the defense would need to do to make that happen. Is that because you think the Clemson is offense is that good and has those matchups against Carolina, or is it because like the A and M game, you just expect the offense will be able to do so little that the defense will continually be put in disadvantageous positions? Yeah, I mean, I I don't think the I don't think that the Chances of them covering is completely out of the realm of possibility. No, no. I, I don't. I don't even know if that's a long shot. Honestly, I mean, Vegas makes these lines. Twenty six is low, though. But Vegas makes these lines what they are for a reason, and they're generally the final scores in these games are generally pretty freaking close to the line, except for twenty five percent of Carolina's schedule in which they were projected I, to win and actually lost. <laughs> so I or not projected to, but the line said they would. Um. So I. <laughs> I don't know. I, I think I, I was more talking in terms of what has to happen for this to be an actual game, like where South Carolina's in it to win the game, not not cover. You know, if, if South Carolina plays their best game of the year defensively, then um, you know they they can cover it. I won't say easily, but they can cover the spread. I mean, it's still it's small. You know, as far as what? Well, no, let me that that. There's nothing small about that spread, other than the fact that. I thought it was going to be thirty-two. Yeah, you That's thought it was going to be in the thirties, but as far as foot, a football game, I mean, if you if you get beat by twenty-six points, you've you've gotten beat handily. You know, there, there's nothing about that spread yeah. says you know four scores it, exactly. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, and seven I think, years ago, and I think the the formula if we're ta- if we're using that word, which makes sense, is. You know, last season, although I don't think anybody, I definitely didn't foresee South Carolina moving the ball and scoring like they did last year, even though that was a an offense that had more explosive potential. Didn't foresee that at all. Didn't foresee 500 passing yards. No way. But it happened. And so I think that team and that formula gives you a better shot to pull the upset than this year's version, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Okay, because good. if you can score, you've got a chance. Like, if you can score, you can win a shootout sometimes. You can have, like Wes was saying, you know, in that scenario with that game, if Clemson had just messed up, stopped themselves, shot themselves in the foot a few times, well, then you're scoring and you have a chance. This year, you look at it and you just feel like South Carolina is not – 
you feel like, okay, if the defense has an awesome game, which would be 21 points? No. 24? Awesome game would be at least 31, I think. I, I would go like 21. Mm-hmm. 21? That would be an wow. incredible game. No, that would be, yeah, that would I, be. I don't look at 31 and say awesome. now Because, like, the A&M game, even though the defense played pretty well for most of that game, I don't look at that and say that was awesome. There's just a lot of firepower. Like, Travis right, Etienne is a Heisman caliber running oh, know, back. Obviously, uh, not this year. There's a bunch year, of them. There's a bunch and, of and them. And all those wide receivers. And Trevor right. Lawrence, who started the season slowly, he's been playing a lot better. I, I feel like the defense can play a good game and, and still give up 31 they points. They could. He's saying you know, awesome, like. They play defense play great. Like it's like great throughout, even given the circumstances. Okay. Even right. if they're on the field for ninety five plays, the offense. You know, okay, you give up twenty one points. That's like your. I'm saying best case scenario, okay. right? right? Like you give up twenty one. South Carolina can't score that. No, that, I mean they haven't shown that they can. They couldn't score that three be, against A and M. That would be that would be us making I mean, a big score leap, a touchdown, to say okay they can go score twenty four. Now maybe within the course of the game. Clemson turns it over three times in their own red zone, and South Carolina can go and hit a play or two. That's what it would take. It would take something like that. They are not going to be able to match this team score for score in either a high or a low-scoring game to me. So that's why, in my opinion, turnover margin is the number one key to a potential upset, which, again, I'm not picking, but if you're going to look at, okay, let's look back at this game. Wow, South Carolina somehow won. What happened? I think it's a huge turnover differential if that happens. And I mean, again, just talking about covering, not even upset, but if we say covering and it's like a 17 point game or something like that, you know, like a comfortable cover, I feel like even still, we're talking about yeah. you have to be probably plus three in turnover margin for that to happen. Because Carolina was plus one in turnover margin against AM and lost by 24. And Clemson's a lot better than AM, as we saw earlier this season. It's just the, the one thing that I look at Clemson's more talented across the board, unquestionably. At pretty much every position. But a guy that national college football pundits, not just South Carolina homers, not local media, not regional media, national pundits were looking at early in the season and saying, this guy is making himself a lot of money. This is one of the best players in college football right now. You know, Let's keep an eye on this. Let's see how the rest of the season goes. And obviously, because the, the season for South Carolina has gone so dramatically sideways, you know, people have kind of stopped paying attention. I don't know how much that's tied up with his productivity. But this is another opportunity with some eyeballs, some some people, NFL people, national college football people that are going to be watching just to watch Clemson for Javon Kinlaw to make himself a little more money. And you look at some of the other guys on that defense, there aren't a ton, but J.C. Horn has NFL aspirations. Javon Kinlaw is going to be playing in the NFL. D.J. Wanham is someone that might find, might find himself, you know, sort of marginal, signing as an undrafted free agent somewhere. So there are some guys that I think will be motivated. I don't really like necessarily question whether or not motivation will be a factor with this team, but if Javon Kinlaw is like, okay, People watching, this is why I'm the best defensive tackle in the country, and it's just an absolute monster on the interior of that defensive line. Gets after Trevor Lawrence, creates some pressure, forces him into some turnovers, helps slow down Clemson's rushing attack. I feel like that's the formula, and it's just going to rest on the shoulders of these couple of guys that can really stand out and change a game for Carolina, and have at times this year. It's that's that's the only way that I see Carolina covering this game. Yeah, and I think you know you look at their offense, and and they can hit you in so many areas, but. To me, you know, sort of trying to get a feel for what their offense is all about. Um, As much as Trevor Lawrence has talked about, as much as he is, you know, the best NFL prospect at quarterback, blah, 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 blah. um, To me, Travis Etienne is the guy that's sort of um, their steadying presence. And, you know, they get him the football. uh, They get him the football in space. But, you know, if you you look at their outputs this year – you know, you go back to North Carolina, which obviously I don't think this is the same football team for Clemson now that it was, you know, when they faced North Carolina as far as the the production and the way they're executing. But, um, you know, really you look, North Carolina held them to 21 points. Texas A&M held them to 24 points. And really um, that's the only two teams that have been even able to slow this offense. Yeah, six straight 45-plus um, point games so, and four straight 52-plus point games. So if you look back, um, their leading rusher against North Carolina, ETN, of course, but 67 yards rushing. Um, Texas A&M, uh, Lynn J. Dixon was actually their leading rusher, 79 yards. Um, and, you know, there's a little stretch there. They still beat – you know, beat Syracuse handily without ETN having 100 yards. Um, ETN just had 61 against Charlotte, but that's that game was over before it started. But if you look, once their offense 
has been able to get going. It's ETN, 127 yards rushing, 45 points against FSU. ETN, 192 yards, 45 points against Louisville. 109 yards, 212 yards, 112 yards, 121 yards. So one, two, three, four, five, six straight 100-yard games for ETN. And, hey, six straight games where they score 45 points or more, including four games in there where they scored 52 points or more. So to me, yeah, they have all these different weapons and all these different ways they can hit you. And even if you take away ETN, they're still going to be able to move the football. They're still going to be able to make plays. They're still going to be able to score points. But if you want any just chance in the world of slowing these guys down, to me it starts with ETN and slowing him down and then putting the game on the shoulders of Trevor Lawrence and you know hoping there's some football karma there for you that he maybe throws a pick or two. And that Carolina's length in the secondary. Will Helms and I talked about this a lot yesterday. Sorry to keep plugging the Get Cocky podcast, but it was a really good one, and Will had a lot of good points, that as talented as this Clemson receiving core is, it, Carolina might have a better matchup in the secondary with them than some of the other teams that they face this year, like in Alabama, where it's more about speed, because you have a guy, Mukwamu, who's 6'4", but he's going to get beat by speed guys. It's just, you know, that's how physics work. If you're 6'4", unless you're like Usain Bolt, who I guess is like 6'6", or whatever. But by and large, you know, Mukwamu is making up for what he lacks in speed in terms of his length and his ability to sort of like cover those things up. Clemson's got a bunch of big receivers. You know, J.C. Horn's a physical guy. I mean, I think he's fast. He's not like outrageously fast. I just, I wonder if that could be a better matchup. And so you look at that, and, and to your point, Wes, if if for Carolina it starts with stopping the run and Clemson wants to establish the run and that's where they're going and then you, you do slow that down, Carolina's done a pretty good job of that this year. I mean, against most of the teams they've faced. You think about the big runs they've given up. It's like the long run against Florida where there was a false start and a hold. And the long run at the end of the Texas A&M game. And again, the defense have been on the field for 75 plays. So yes, you blame them because they gave it up, but also the game was over at that point. It was like relatively inconsequential. I think that was the touchdown to make it 30. So, it, you know, by and large, it didn't matter. They've done a good job defending the run, at least traditional run looks this year. Your year. So I, I feel like if that is what you're saying, the game plan is for Carolina, that's almost reason for encouragement because you feel that you're, you're not asking them to do something that, that they haven't shown they can do this year, at least defensively. Yeah, I think the the problem is, you know, I think we all can agree that, you know, this defense is in a lot better position, as good as Clemson is, and I still, I mean, this Clemson team is going to cause even the best defense in the country issues, you know, in game planning and in execution. Um, but I, I think we can all agree that there's zero doubt that this defense is better equipped than last season's healthy defense, you know, to to be able to get some stops here and there but certainly better than what we saw at the end of last year, you know, with, with who was starting, who was playing, you know, I mean, you had Brad Johnson as a sophomore playing 90 or a hundred snaps and like coming off the flu in that game, played every special team and most of the defensive snaps and guys who have not to that point had not played um, and have not played again since, you know, um, playing in that football game just because of the lack of depth. So they're in better position now. They got more depth up front. You know, they they've they've got athletically they're they're better. Is Mukwamu but, the only guy that played in the secondary in last year's game that'll be playing in this year's game? Well Horn was out. <clears throat> yep. Yep. And uh um, And eBay was out. eBay was out. eBay was out. RJ Roderick played. Oh yeah, I'm right. He played he got hurt in that game though, didn't he? Didn't he? I thought he went out in like the second quarter. I feel like he got hurt. He he's been banged uh, up uh, number thirty six. Uh was that Tayshawn Gibson? J- um, Jonathan Gibson. Jonathan, Jonathan Gibson. Gibson. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Jonathan Gibson came in that game. Um, so I think Roderick even got hurt. And Roderick had been dealing with injuries the final quarter of the season anyway. I think he was in and out. Um, and I think he tried – maybe he tried to play, banged up, yeah. and then and then was hurt. But, yeah. I mean, the – I don't know. I, I don't want to call guys out. But the – I mean, it was literally third string in a lot of spots and then, like, seventh – String, yeah, at some safety and I, spots. <laughs> and so, I mean, even if you feel, even in, you know, feeling better about the defense this year, I think you just, I mean, the offense has not even been average lately. No, no, no. I mean, they, and so that causes you huge issues of yeah. field position and, you know, time of possession and putting them on the field too much against this offense is just a bad recipe. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not going to cannibalize our buy or sell, although we're going to get there in just a second. But it's, it's been so bad, and there is, I don't, I don't see any formula for success other than. Well, not even a formula for success, but I think I think there are one of two 
ways that South Carolina can approach their offensive game plan Saturday. Try to do what you did last year because even though you don't have the horses and even though Clemson has it on tape and Clemson's going to be probably very sensitive to not giving up a similarly massive offensive performance through the air, it's your best bet because just take some shots and maybe you're going to throw some picks and they'll basically just end up being like punts on second and third down and maybe you'll hit a couple of them and change the momentum of the game, but you're not going to sustain long drives. So it's that or put Joyner in there and just say, let's try some crazy stuff. So here's my question to y'all because I've been asked this question. You know, Will Muschamp has talked a lot about, you know, things like being more creative and, and you know, trying to find a way to manufacture um, – some some movement on offense, whether it's stuff like trick plays or using tempo. He's talked about all those different things. So, you know, going into this game, I guess I asked, you know, two different ways, you know, what should the approach be or or maybe what do you expect or just answer either one of them. But, you know, does South Carolina need to come out given that you probably don't feel great about your <clears throat> offense going in? So do you bleed the play clock down to one, mm. right? And and sort of like we saw the the first – at least the first year that was, you remember how South Carolina was literally going to the sideline because Clemson, frankly, and there's nothing wrong with it in my opinion, but they, they, they take signals, which is fine. I'm fine with it. If you show your signals, somebody takes them, whatever. And, and then, so we saw that and obviously they didn't have success because they weren't really that good offensively. So do they do that to protect their defense a little bit more? Or do you go the opposite direction and say, we got to find a way to manufacture stuff. So you go more towards what we saw last year with, some of the tempos, some of the, you know, Clemson look, playing against what Clemson does defensively, looking to the sideline of their calls and getting them all out of sorts. I would imagine they're going to adjust to that this year. For me, I just don't think you can afford to go warp speed three, three and out. No. I think you got to slow it down. You can do a little column A, a little column B. I yeah, say, right. por que no los dos, as my roommate used to say. Yeah, I think you got to do some. Why not probably. both? Bleed the play clock down to one every single play and just run – four verts every single play or like you know deep post deep dig just don't throw the ball shorter than 10 yards down the field because like i said you need some you need to steal possessions you need to have game breaking plays you're not going to be able to methodically drive against clemson and then secondarily i think a lot of the criticism about ryan Helinski this season has been that he doesn't throw the ball down the field and some of that is maybe on him some of that is maybe on the play calling some of that is maybe that he hasn't been super accurate on the deep ball or that carolina's receivers haven't gotten the separation or made the catches but the point is It's not a big sample size of him throwing the ball down the field. This is a great opportunity. See what he can do. Have him throw 20 deep balls this game and see how accurately he throws it. I don't know how many he's thrown this year, but it's not a ton. And use that as part of, you know, your bank of information to see what you have next year. You know, how much do you need to factor that in to what the plan of the quarterback position is going into next year? And I think that's the same argument for playing Joyner a lot this game. Carolina's not going to a bowl game, even if they win this. Just take stock of what you have and what you need to improve and and you know, what next year might look like. Yeah, I think the the difficult thing is then you have to, and it's a big part of the conversation for me, you have to find a way to protect him long enough to, to get these deep balls off. And, you know, you've got, I, I think, one of the better defensive coaches at dialing up pressure. And, and, you know, some of that is he's got the best players. But, you know, a lot of defensive coaches, if they're in a position – to where they feel really good about their defensive front and feel really good about their talent. You know, they're, oh, I can get pressure with four, then I can use all the other seven guys, drop them back into coverage, and uh, I can take, I can still get pressure on the quarterback with a more conservative approach. Whereas Venables, he takes it and flips flips it on his head and says, I have better pass rushers than you. I have better players on my defense. So now I'm going to just double up the pressure. I'm going to send five guys, six guys. I'm going to put my guys out here on an island, and um, you're not going to be able to get the ball off in time. And if you do, I trust my guys to to cover you. Now, South Carolina, I look back at the game last year, um, a lot of these big plays are Jake Bentley's getting the ball out, I mean, just split seconds before he's going to get crushed. Um, so, you know, it's going to have to be a thing where you and, – and, you know, there's talk that they're – potentially going to shuffle the offensive line this mm-hmm. week. Ja'Kai Moore out to tackle, um, or in at tackle, and, you know, Hutchinson, Hutchinson in a guard, in a guard yeah. and moving Dylan Wanham to left tackle. And, um, you know, th- there's a lot there where you're going to have to do a good job of communicating and 
um, being on the same page on the offensive front. And last year, they did just a good enough job of that. And, you know, again, to his credit, that was McClendon's best game plan. They uh, they cut they cut Clemson, you know, yeah. as far as second play of the game, offensive line is diving at their knees. They're chopping them down. And um, that was part of the game plan is tr- do everything you can to slow down this pass rush. And, um, you know, second play of the game is a quick screen to the outside. You're uh, you're uh, cutting down at Clemson. Um, second drive, you're cutting them again. You're doing everything you can to try to slow the rush. And then still, Bentley's having to get the ball out and, ha- you know, frankly hit some passes that maybe 80% of the time don't sneak through. And, and in this case, they do. So, um, But you hit on it. That's it. For me, it's not about – I hear what you're saying. You have to have time – to throw it on the field, and that's true. But it's not about the offensive line. It's not about you know moving in Ja'Kai Moore, moving out Jordan Rhodes, whatever combination they think they might find. This is where, and I guess I should say as a caveat, I don't think Brian McClendon is going to keep his job. Not to say that he won't be at South Carolina, but he's not going to be the full solo offensive coordinator next year. not going to be calling the plays. I, I would sure, be shocked yeah. if that were the case. But if you are Brian McClendon, this is an opportunity to, to I don't know, prove yourself maybe in his mind, you know, make a, make a strong bid for his job because – the other way that you can stave off pass rush is play design, window dressing. You know, a lot of teams that are, I don't want to say inferior, but like Appalachian State doesn't have the same level of talent as South Carolina. So how do they make up for it? How do they end up scoring points? How do they upset teams like Carolina and Michigan and, you know, whomever else? They do it by making it tricky for the other teams to have eye discipline. So that means, you know, faking speed sweeps and play actions and just like interesting play design. Don't just have, you know, five wide and then you're just in a, empty backfield and then you take a seven step drop and throw it on the field because Clemson knows exactly what you're going to do you're not going to have the time they can pin their ears back give them something else to look at give them something else to think about and we've seen at times when Brian McClendon has has drawn up some really creative plays and some really creative looks they're just going to need all of that on Saturday yeah I mean last year's game plan was very creative obviously and then they executed it well but again you know the firepower it goes back to what Wes said I mean Four of the five players who factored in prominently are, are not on the field this year. Mm-hmm. You know, assuming now, Will Mus- I, I still don't feel great about Brian Edwards playing in the game. No. He it seemed to be a little bit more. You know, hey, he might give it a go. We'll see. Um, but you know, no Kill Pollard, no Debo Samuel, no Jake Bentley. Um, you know, th- now they will have Tavian Feaster back, have Rico Dattle. So that that's another key in this game. I mean. Clemson's going to make some plays like on third down. Third down, you know, I mentioned turnovers, but third down's another big thing. South is going to get in some third down situations. They're going to have to make some plays offensively to move the chains, and that's going to be tough because they've had trouble with pressure this year. All right. And, can't um, go over their first 10 third downs on right, Saturday. Right, right. You can't do that. And, and Venables is going to be bringing pressure from everywhere. You know, the other thing is, you know, Clemson's going to get in some third nines and just throw a back shoulder or throw a ball up, and a guy's going to make a play, you know, and, and you just – tip your hat and you move on to the next one but they can't let them run the football I mean last year they were dominant there that was something that Will Muschamp pointed out as being the difference for the past few years is South Carolina has not run the ball effectively and Clemson has run the ball very effectively so that's something that they've got to do a better job of as well Um, they've got to do it offensively I don't know how but they've got to find a way another reason is because of that pressure I talked about Got to find some way to run the ball against this team. And I'm sure Clemson anticipates that, which will make it even tougher. All right. So, if we're talking about what can Carolina do, I don't even know why we're talking about that because that's, like, fundamentally the least interesting thing about this game. But if we are going to do that, buy or sell, Trey Atkins will have 200-plus yards receiving. I'm just kidding. Do um, you want to tell us about the <laughs> – tell us about Terry Bishop. Bishop Real Estate Group is our football content sponsor and sponsors buy or sell – here on another Carolina podcast, facebook.com slash the Terry Bishop team or 803-665-1442. Terry, former Gamecock quarterback and 36 years of real estate experience in Columbia. So give him a call if you need to buy or sell or invest in real estate. We're doing a mega buy or sell because it's the last buy or sell of the football season. And I just thought of so many good ones that I wanted to just blow it up and have some fun. So here comes mega buy or sell, starting with number one. Buy or sell. There will be more South Carolina football fans than Clemson football fans in Williams Bryce Stadium at the end of the third quarter. The end of the oh, third. Oh, you changed it. I did change it. Okay. Yeah. What was it before? Before it was when the clock hit zero. So he gave me a little preview. Yeah. In. Yeah. So that's... he was like, Oh, I'm easily buying that. I was like, Okay, I'll make this a little more interesting. Hold on, say it again so I make sure I say the 
So it's the question is there will be more Carolina Josh is fans. right. I'll have so much trouble with this. There will be more Carolina yeah. fans than Clemson fans at the end of the third quarter in williams Bryce Stadium, not in America. <laughs> you got a preview, so you got to go first. Well, he changed it. Changed the... Um, all right, we so le- at least knew the... By ourselves, there will be going. more Carolina fans in the stadium in the end of the third quarter. I'll still buy. I'll still buy. Yep. I'll say there'll be more. Mm. I sell. It's a tough one. All right. Westifer is selling. Chrisley is buying. Um, I'm going to. I'll buy it. I'll buy it. I think it'll be what? I think uh, I think it'll be kind of a paltry crowd on Saturday anyway. And I think. <laughs> If Carolina fans make it to the fourth quarter, that those are most of the people that are going to kind of stay till the end anyway, or at least stay until kind of like that last touchdown that puts Clemson up 118 to four, um, because Carolina's going to get two safeties on Saturday is my prediction. Spoiler, um, so I'm going to buy that too. I shouldn't buy that because that's stupid, but I'm going to buy it. Uh, buyer sell number two, Ryan Herbert Halinski. Did y'all know that's his middle name? Yeah, it's not. But Ryan Halinski will have more passing yards than Trevor Lawrence. Buy or sell. Sell. I would sell as well. Whoa, quick quick selling, yep. guys. No no reason? Fire sale. Because you don't think Lindsay's going to play? No, there's a reason. What's the reason? I think Trevor Lawrence is going to have more passing yards. How long is he going to play? Is he going to play three quarters? Two quarters? One quarter? I don't know. I just think... Probably play more than a quarter. I just haven't seen... You know, there's just not... Let's say Trevor Lawrence... I mean, even if you said... Trevor Lawrence plays, you know, two, three quarters, whatever it may be. And he'll play. I think he'll play more than that. He'll play most of the game. I think, I think he'll play most of the game. I agree with that. But, you know, he, he, even if he had sort of a substandard game, I mean, they, they just got so much more firepower. And you just haven't seen enough from South Carolina's offense to think that they're going to have – I mean, picking them to have 200 passing yards at this point would be sort of – right? I mean, going out on a limb a little bit. But they're going to be trailing like a lot, so they're there. going to have to throw it a lot. I just, but I still, you know, even if even if that's the case, do you see a lot of success in the passing game? I don't know that you do. So. All right, so here you go. If we say that this Carolina Clemson game is is going to follow a similar trajectory to Clemson's last six games, forty five to fourteen, forty five to ten, fifty nine to seven, fifty nine to fourteen, fifty five to ten, fifty two to three. If we think it's going to be something like that, which I think we probably do. Here are Trevor Lawrence's passing totals in each of those games, respectively. 170, 233, 275, 218, 276, 272. It's pretty good. Sure. But you don't think Carolina, just by virtue of being down by 20, will get to 300 passing yards? I mean, they could, but I just, I I mean, the South Carolina secondary, to me, is still the weakness on this defense. Yep. And um, I think there'll be some big plays from Clemson's offense. And, um, you know, and, and I think Trevor Lawrence is going to play most of the game. I, I yeah, don't, okay. I could be, I could be dead wrong, but I, I don't think this game is going to be, as much as I don't think, obviously, South Carolina wins the game, I don't think this game is going to just be over by the second quarter either. I, I think that there's a, there's a pride factor from the defense, and I think they'll be, they'll be able to do just enough for at least the first half of the game that keeps South Carolina at least somewhat in the game. And, um, you know, honestly, not that South Carolina is a great team. We know that right now that they're not. But um, Clemson just really hasn't been tested at all lately. Um, you know. You know or, or really the season. And, and by the way, for what it's worth, the games where Clemson has been tested, Texas A&M, Lawrence, 268. North Carolina, Lawrence, 206. He hasn't thrown for more than 300 yards this year. He hasn't had to. But yeah, yeah. That, that surprised me when I was That's just very surprising. perusing um, the statue. Which he struggled a little bit early, he early did. on, at yeah. least for the standard everyone had set for mm-hmm. you know for his for his expectations. But um, he's been a lot more efficient. I feel like probably the last month and a half or yeah. so. But um, yeah, I I I think he's in there for most of the game, and I, I think Carolina does just enough to at least keep this a conversation um, where not just you know. You mentioned sixty three seventeen, where it was just. I think that game was twenty one to nothing, like right out of the gate. Yeah, just um, instantly. Yeah, and then you know you look uh, the game when they first got here, the year one when South Carolina ran the clock down. That game was over before it started. Um, 
you know, I, I think that's twice I've used that phrase. But, yeah, I, I think they'll hang in there. And I, I will say, um, survive the first quarter, mm. to me, has to be a key. That's going to be in my keys to victory or our keys to victory. Dope. Clemson has outscored opponents 142 to 10 in the first quarter of this year. That's a good step. That is the Real biggest scoring margin in FBS history. <laughs> well, this season, <laughs> probably, but 132 point difference in the first quarter. That's strong. That's crazy. So, survive the first quarter. That's the, we talk about the blueprint. If Clemson has to even think they're in a football game, they haven't had to be in a close football game since North Carolina. On September 28th. Yes. It's a long time ago. Two months ago. Be, yeah, it'll be exactly two months. Oh, no, that's Thanksgiving. Sorry. Yeah. Almost, <laughs> more than two just over ago. two months. Yeah. Clemson A and M was zero zero after the first quarter. That was a fourteen point margin, mm-hmm. right? At the end of the game, it's twenty four ten. Yeah. So it was zero zero, and then it was, I think, fourteen to nothing, or I lost it. Fourteen to nothing, or fourteen to three at halftime. Um, and A and M had four, a chance seventeen to, score to three. I'm sorry, before the half. Yes, they did, and they messed up. So seventeen to three at halftime, but it was zero zero after the first quarter, right? And then the Clemson North Carolina game, uh, it was seven nothing UNC. After one quarter, hmm. and tied at fourteen at the half. So the two so games that Clemson point. has played within three touchdowns, they have been minus seven in first quarter margin. First quarter scoring margin. That's correct. That's interesting. Okay. So that's well. This is a nice segue key. into our third buy or sell. By the way, we're doing five of these today. Uh, buy or sell. Clemson will score more than, not more than or equal to. They will score more than because also people don't score this number on its own a lot. But Clemson will score more than forty points. Oh man, I'm I'm selling. I I okay. I think I think Carolina's defense does just enough. Um And I get, you know, 52, 55, 59, 59, 45, <laughs> 45 is the last How many games was that? 6. But 21 and 24 against North Carolina and A&M. Yeah, but and both of whom beat Carolina. <laughs> right. Yeah, and they did. And I and you know they Wake Wake Forest has had a solid season, and Clemson just smashed them like it was nothing. Yeah. Well, Wake Wake's strength was their offense more than their defense, so the three is I think a little more surprising than the fifty-two. But yeah, and they were missing some guys on offense too. Um, where and I here here's what sort of has popped into my brain as we've been having this conversation of these teams: Wake Forest, NC State, Wofford, Boston College, Louisville, Florida State. How does South Carolina's defense match up with those teams? I think better than all of them. Better than all of them, but the offense is maybe one of the worst. I mean, and now it Wake might Forest, be worse than Wofford's offense. <laughs> no, I don't know about that. Does, off, does Wofford run the triple option? I think they went away from that a little bit. I should know. Um, my brother goes there. But if they run the triple option, then oh, that offense is harder to stop than Carolina's right now. Well, it, the, I think the issue, the bigger issue, even than how good the defenses are, I mean that weighs into it obviously when you're thinking about can they stop a team, but just South Carolina's <laughs> offense yeah. is yeah, just has been so bad that again it's put the put defense in, in very very bad yeah. spots. And, and so, as good as Joe Charlton's been, I feel like yeah. Clemson's going to get a lot of short fields. Yeah, I mean definitely. So that's a big concern. I mean I look at so South Carolina, they've given up forty points or more, and I know you said more than forty. Okay, so they've given up more than forty points twice this year. Tennessee. Yep, 14 Another, points on special teams in Alabama. Yep, so even then, Tennessee didn't score on offense. No. So, but you're the, just saying the, in the general. The huge offensive outputs, I mean, what was it, giving up 34 to Missouri, they only gave up 20 on defense. Uh, yeah. 41 against Tennessee, they gave up 23 on defense. The A&M game kind of sticks out because they didn't have any non-offensive touchdowns in that game, but it was just such a weird, like, that that fourth quarter was just like, the and, and the Alabama game was all offense two if I'm remembering correctly. It was all offense including a late touchdown kind of in garbage time. They swapped late touchdowns. So when I look at this schedule the best offensive teams that South Carolina has played are Alabama Florida and Clemson will be one. Those are the top three. So Florida had uh, 38. Alabama had 47. I think South Carolina is playing worse offensively markedly so than in either of those two games. So I'm going to buy your question. That's way better rationale than I could come up with. I wanted to buy it anyway, and you just did all the hard work for me, so I'm also going to buy. Thank you for that. Uh, this next one's my favorite. So Tavian Feaster, y'all have heard of him. Tavian 
if he were from Europe. That's what we would call him, Tavien Feaster. He's going to play. Rico Dowdle is, I guess, going to play, but hasn't been healthy. I don't know how healthy he's, I don't know how much the open week helped him get back to full health. But based on what we saw the last couple of weeks, I would expect that Feaster ends up getting more carries in this game just because Rico hasn't been himself. That being said, Tavien has 117 rushing yards in the South Carolina Clemson rivalry in his career. Will Tavien Fiaster finish <laughs> his college football career with more rushing yards against South Carolina or more rushing yards against Clemson? Oh, shit, that's not buy or sell. Buy or sell, <laughs> Tavian Feaster will finish his college football career with more rushing yards against Clemson than against South Carolina. <laughs> you have a quick answer, Chris? I mean, my... I don't need to litigate it in my head. My, um, hey, dude, that's the that's this whole my, exercise. Uh, <laughs> my just initial gut doll was to sell. Okay, I got you. Yep. No, no real reason. You know, I can't tell if Wes is agonizing this or is, or over this, or if he just thought it was a stupid question. No, I like the question. I just, um, man, Carolina hasn't given their backs any room the last two weeks. Yeah. Um, well, that's why I thought about saying maybe all-purpose yards, because especially as aggressive as Clemson's defense is, maybe they could see Tavian Feaster, maybe they could use him a little more in the screen game, which we've been saying every single week for this entire season, and they haven't done it. He does have 19 receiving yards against Carolina, so whatever that is, total 19, 17, 30, what is that, uh, 36? 136, we have a, would you rather do 117 rushing yards or 136 all-purpose yards? I think I'd probably sell them both. Okay. Um, it's. Just, I mean, who? If you're South Carolina, if you're a South Carolina fan, listen to this. You gotta, you gotta hope and pray they cooked up something during the bye week to be able to run the football again. Because I've never. <laughs> I don't know why, but that just made me. Laugh. I've Cooked never seen. Something. He's been laughing at my. <laughs> I just. I'm not you're, you're to, on, I know you're on fire today. I like no, it. But here's how, <laughs> and I, I've written about it, but I, I don't. I still don't quite understand. How the running game was so like really good. Yeah, one of the like, best in the SEC. Like not a fluke. No, like good against and, good defenses. Yes, yeah. and then all of a sudden, it's like <laughs> the ability to run is completely gone. Um, I think it's because Rico and Tavian weren't healthy. I think it's as simple as that. Because I, I hate think, reason. When, it's I, a when, reason. when I would, yeah, but when I would check in with Will simple. after those games, after Appalachian State and after Texas A and M. All the offensive line run blocking grades were kind of the same as they had been all season long. So it's not like the off. I mean, I know people were like, especially when you're looking at it in pass protection, it's like, oh, well, those guys, you know, just couldn't get a hat on a hat as well. Muschamp likes to say. But I think more than anything else, that just comes down to Rico was healthy. He was hitting the holes. He was breaking tackles. He was making guys miss. And he wasn't doing that. And then Feaster's been out. And I think that's the difference. See, when I when I rewatch those games. There were no holes to hit anymore either. It's, you know, the offensive line hadn't been great in the running game, but they were at least giving those guys room to operate and at least getting them through the first level and then they maybe make a guy miss or, or make something happen to get them to the second level. Um, just not, none of that was there anymore. The, the first, you know, you're having guys hit your running back at the line of scrimmage, behind the line of scrimmage, um, it's not a one-on-one situation anymore. It's like two defenders are getting there, three defenders are getting there. Some of that was Texas A&M was just they were really good up front. But a lot of that is, um, you know, I think teams are just basically preying on the pin and pull and that they're saying we're taking this away. We're going to aggressively attack you in the holes of this scheme and there's nothing you can do to stop it. And um, South Carolina doesn't have a change-up or a counter they, they've tried. They've, they've done different things. They've tried to go back to inside zone. They've tried to run counter plays. They've tried to run the little dart play. But they don't get the push with the inside zone that they were getting with, you know, the pin and pull. So you go back to something that wasn't really a successful scheme for you anyway, something you don't do incredibly well. Um, it, it's just been it's been a disaster. I mean, I, I sell. I'm, I'm completely off the train. Yeah, here, I, I sell it too, and I I, I sell it with a heavy heart because I just think that I think that'd be really cool and kind of fun. A nice little storyline coming out of the Clemson game, if if that were to be the case. But if, if he was anyway. healthy, completely healthy, and the line, if we were going into this game with the line, offensive line still playing the way it was, you know, three or four games ago, I'd be sitting here like Tavian Feaster might rush for 200 yards on these guys because yeah. he's sure. You're sure he wants this game probably more than anybody on that sideline, but 
you just it's hard to predict that. Actually, no, y'all both sold it. I don't think it's going to happen, but I'm going to buy it just for the sake of variance, and I want to be right. If it does happen, I want to be on the right side of history. So I'm buying the Tavian Feaster will finish his college football career with more rushing yards against Clemson than against South Carolina. And finally, it would not be another South Carolina, sorry, it would not be another Carolina podcast if we did not finish our buy or sell this season with a reprise, a reprise. Do y'all say reprise or reprise? Reprise. Reprise, Wes? Reprise, I guess. It would not be another Carolina podcast if we did not finish with this beautiful reprise. Buy or sell, South Carolina will score 30 points against an FBS team in 2019. <laughs> oh, God. I wish I wish I could buy this so badly. Because you want Carolina to score 30 or because you want me to be wrong? <laughs> well, it's just been We did this a... after the Missouri game, and y'all bought it very confidently, and I sold it sarcastically. And I don't think any of the three of us actually thought that it wouldn't happen, and here we are. And there's a 0% chance that Carolina's going to score 30 points on Saturday. So... Yeah, it's got to be a sell. Oh. It's a sell for me, dog. <laughs> <laughs> it's so bad. Okay. But you uh, know what? In, uh, in, I'm going to do what you just did. I'm going down. I'm going down swinging. I'm going uh, down with this ship. Bye. Oh, I thought you were going to wow. say sell, but it's close. No, <laughs> <laughs> that's that's his line. But All right. no, I'm I'm buying it. It may it may be a sinking ship, but I'm going down. I with didn't it. even use the close thing in weeks. No, you haven't. We've, we've nah. well, we've, we've kind of co-opted it, so we use it. So you don't have to, right? Yeah. Mm. All right, you have a buy in all caps. Oh, this is uh, this is really bittersweet. This is a fun segment that it's my favorite segment. I've really enjoyed doing this. I'm a little bit sad that it's, it's all over. So I'm I'm glad we did a big one. Five buy or sell for you at the end of the year. We'll at least do a, another podcast next week to. Wrap up our buy or sell, wrap up the season, all those kinds of things. But and um, then we'll be talking recruiting yeah. in the future ones. Recruiting and hoops. Hopefully, uh, interest in the basketball team is still high, relatively high after this Cancun challenge. But that is a conversation for another podcast. Before we do get out of here, since there is one more football game, one more opportunity for you to correctly guess the final scoreline of the Carolina yes. Clemson game for a chance to win. A bunch of Slotskis. Yeah, sixty dollars worth of Slotskis, uh, which is a lot of Slotskis. Um, yeah, come try our challenge where you can predict the score of the South Carolina Clemson game, and then we'll be sending out a gift card to whoever has the closest score to the actual score. Oh, and um, yeah, it's cool. You get a gift card, and then they send you. I think it's like four different sandwiches, your chips, um, sauces, pretty much everything you need for a tailgate. Um, and I guess you'll, if you win this one, you'll be using it for the Super a basketball Bowl. tailgate, yeah. the Super Bowl, baseball game. Plenty of stuff game. to still watch. Oh, yeah. Um, you can watch the bowl games at home. You can do a couch tailgate. Um, so, yeah. You or can you can still... just eat it all for dinner one yeah, night. I was going to say, you don't need sports. Yeah. Yes. You don't need an occasion to eat it. at Slotchkeys. You just need to be hungry. Yeah. And you don't and even I, really need to be hungry. I would love to see someone see how much one of these they could put back just themselves. Yeah. So, yeah, you have one. You got one. I did. How much of it do you think you could have eaten by yourself in like a, in like one sitting, say thirty minutes <laughs> or an hour? I uh, half. No, no, no. Wow. So Maybe you're frail is what a you're quarter. Me. No, there's. How about how about we get one with the? I mean, there's like oh. ten ch- ten bags of chips with this thing. All right, we need to get one. Okay, okay and then we're gonna have a live eating. That's a really good idea during the podcast. Do we get Derek Phillips and Kev Roche in on this? It's too many people. Okay. Uh, yeah, we're gonna. Okay, we'll get the. Don't you think that's well, too many? We need to get like, them involved in some fair. way. That's I, just, D- Derek's gonna be mad if we do this without well, him. He can be the referee. Okay, the judge. Well, he'll be the ref, and Kev can do. Kev, Kev, can Kev can will do the commentary. At, he can draw it. As yeah, we're yes. we'll do art commentary. <laughs> I just think five impaired. people. Then that's like two bags of chips each. Oh gosh. Right. Like that's. I know that's for you, Pearson. That's hard, but you know, it's thinking doable. about all the sodium, I'm gonna be so bloated. Yeah. If I eat all this whole thing by myself, point is, you don't have to eat it by yourself. You could, but you can use it for anything. And all you have to do is yeah. correctly guess the final score of the Carolina Clemson game. And my recommendation would be to guess uh, that South Carolina goes over thirty. That Carolina goes over thirty, and that Clemson scores somewhere between ninety and two hundred and twelve. I don't think they will beat Georgia Tech's record that they set against Cumberland College all those years ago. That's my final prediction. You can play that on the Insiders Forum or on the Fighting Gamecock Forum. Fighting Gamecock Forum is for free. 
Insiders Forum is if you are a subscriber to Gamecock Central. And if you're not a subscriber to Gamecock Central and you want to be because you want to play the Slotchkeys Challenge on the Insiders Forum. We actually or just, have a great special going on now. you got a great special. Yeah, different than Different GC than Pod. using the exclusive podcast code GCPod to get a yes. month for free. Um, this is one of my favorite specials that we run. Right now, um, you get 50% off a your first year of an annual subscription. So um, that puts it down to like 49 bucks and some cents. Jeez. And, uh, that's, that's half for those of you that are mathfully impaired. Yes. And with that, you also get a e-gift card for $49.50 to the Rivals Fan Shop. Um, so basically that pays for what you've, d- what you've spent there. And the Rivals Fan Shop, you can go check it out. It actually is officially licensed um, you know, with Under Armour gear. So it's not just some junk Gamecock gear. It's the actual, they got the uh, regular coaches polo. They've got hoodies. They've got jerseys. Um, let's see. They got Pants. all the You're wearing it right now. Y'all are always sporting it, and it looks really sharp. Um, yeah, so you, you got, uh, they even got those. I, I don't personally like the new Under Armour Garnet Gamecock shoes that the players wear sometimes. I've seen those everywhere. But they have them on here. Some people love those. Yeah, so don't spend your $50 on that. Yeah, or basketball judge jerseys. Um, they got all kinds of stuff. I'm trying to figure out what some of this stuff actually is. And that's um, if you sign up for a year for Gamecock Central right now? Yes. That's you will awesome. get a. So I, bas- basically, you spend $50 and you get a $50 gift card, basically. So you're not zero. Since this is the last like in season podcast, I just wanted to do this real quick tangent. So, like. Some people that listen, we've had, I've had several people email me and say, I heard you guys on the podcast, so I subscribed, which we appreciate. That's terrific. That's awesome. Thank you so much. Why do, why should people subscribe to Gamecock Central? You're asking me? Yeah. Why do y'all think? Pearson, you're a member. So I honestly, if I'm going to, I don't think I'm in character most of the time, but if I'm going to step out of as much of a character as I get into, I will say what I do every day here and on my local show on 107.5 The Game, I consider it to fundamentally be entertainment. And what you guys do, what you and Wes and Colin and Will and everyone that works there does, is actual journalism and actual reporting. And I couldn't do my job if you didn't do what you did. And I choose you guys because I know it's reliable. I know it's the best quality. I know that I obviously do this for y'all. So I don't even want to say I'm biased because the reason that I do this with y'all is because I like y'all. You know, I didn't, it wasn't the other way around. I was on Gamecock Central long before. Um, a lot of my show prep, I'm, I'm reading stuff. I'm getting stats and nuggets from you guys. I'm quoting Colin Taylor constantly on my show because he's digging up all you the do best like Colin, nuggets. don't you? Yeah, Colin's, Colin's the best. Good. He's the um, best. Because he asked, the, he asked my, uh, my Thanksgiving question to Will Muschamp today during his press conference. Yes, so, he did. I mean, the, the coverage is unparalleled for, for basketball, men's and women's, for football, for baseball. It's reliable. And I use it a heck of a lot for my show prep every day. So that's why I use Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Yeah, that was. I don't know if I can say. No, I mean, that, I, that I just good. think. I mean, the, I, and I like the community aspect yeah, as good well. Community. Great community. Um, before we go, after this conversation, we got to talk Thanksgiving for at least 30 seconds, sure. but yeah. continue. Chris. I was just going to say, I mean, I would encourage anybody, you know, th- there's sort of like a, mm, out there somewhere, there's just sort of this notion of like, oh, I can maybe get that information for free and stuff like that. Oh, maybe yeah, I can no. just hear it on the no. podcast. Yeah. No. And, and I just, I, we've had a lot of people that end up subscribing that say, yeah, no, that's not really the case. And so it's not like a braggadocious point to say it, but we put a lot of stuff for members only on our site. If you want to ask myself a question or Wes a question at any time, you can come on the Insiders Forum and do it. Um, you pretty much got access to us at any time, access to all of our content. It's going to be an interesting off season. We know that. Uh, we're going to cover all that stuff. A lot of that stuff is going to be, you know, subscribers only content. Yeah. So, and oh my gosh, subscribe before early signing period, or else you're going to miss everything. Yeah, I and mean, you're going to look like an idiot in front of all your friends. <laughs> it's, good, it's going to be it's going to be interesting for a lot of reasons, recruiting being one of them, and so. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's a great time with all these deals we got going on. So, and I like yeah. the point about community, too, because I, I like weighing in on the message boards whenever, I don't know, whenever I get tagged in a thread. I don't, like, always weigh in on them. I, I lurk on some of them, but uh, I really appreciate it. Like, for even for the people that hate me, like, I really appreciate that you take advantage of the fact that you have that forum to express that. It stresses my mom out, but I think it's fun. So <laughs> I just like interacting with you all. So that, that, I'm glad you brought up the community, Wes, because I think it's fun. Shout out USC Beckham. He's always nice to me. And then there's somebody, I can't remember is or her name, but they have a blue lobster, and I, I think they're nice to me sometimes. And then everyone else, like I said, that's mean to me too. I appreciate it because that means you're listening, which is what we uh, what we strive for around here. Yes. My favorite one was the one that called you a fungus because yeah. you like grew on them yeah. or that's, something. That's a yes. really strange – that's a very thoughtful compliment, and I really you appreciate it. You know that they that meant one. it. Yeah, yeah exactly. 
Exactly. Really um, took some time to think of it. Yep. All right, Thanksgiving. First of all, we'll piggyback off of the question from the presser. Stuffing or dressing? So my family does dressing. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. Mine too. Dressing. Mm-hmm. All I feel way. like stuffing's I don't want to say antiquated, but I feel like it's just much less common to see stuffing. Stuffing. Have you ever had oyster dressing? Is it actual oysters? Yeah, you put oysters. It's got oysters. So I've good. I've only recently found out that I'm not allergic to shellfish. I spent most of my life either being allergic or thinking I was allergic or some combination, but I went and got an allergy test recently. Um, so I've never eaten oysters, so I've not had that. I haven't had, had it either. I, apparently, I'm going to get to try that this Thanksgiving, but I've never had it before. You doing Thanksgiving uh, with Chris? It's exciting. No. Uh, <laughs> but, um, all right. Oh, he's very dismissive of all of that. Uh, no. no, I mean, I'm saying I, if, if I was invited, I would consider it. But, um, it doesn't sound like it. All right. What is, what is on your Thanksgiving plate? Chris, I'll let you go first. If, if you're listening and you're like, I don't care, we're done with the football talk, so you can... You can close the podcast now if you don't care what we're eating for Thanksgiving. That's but. weird. But is an I mean, I guess, I guess maybe like if you are an international listener and you don't understand what Thanksgiving is, and that's totally reasonable. But if you are, no, I, I will if get, you are an American citizen and you're someone that observes Thanksgiving, but you don't like it that much, I want you to stop listening right now. No, I'm saying not that they don't like Thanksgiving, just that they are. I we get comments on our YouTube of all places where people will say. I don't. I don't care about your actual lives. Talk about football. Hmm. So, but see, I disagree with that um, fundamentally. Yeah, what, even but if I'm they say that, if, I think they're not being if, truthful to themselves. If you don't want to hear about this, not, we're done talking football. But yeah. um, what's on y'all's plate? Um, aside from all of it, in general, no, there are some. I'll go through the ones we should go through. Overrated foods too. All right, but on my plate, right. So first of all, I'm not sure exactly what my mom's cooking. Um, we're gonna have one dinner at my mom's house or lunch. I know some staples she'll have. So, obviously, turkey, gravy. Dressing is not my favorite. I will put some on just out of. Ooh. It's not my favorite. I don't like it as much Wes as turkey. Wes is deceased right now, and I'm close. If, if, you, if, you, if you said dressing, I will put some on my plate, and I will eat some, and I will enjoy it. Macaroni and cheese. Huge. Um, I might even go, like, triple starch and go mashed potatoes. Also, also with gravy. Um, okay. Good. Mashed potatoes. Let me think. Strong. Let me think of what else. Green beans or green bean casserole. Do you have a preference? I like green beans more than green bean casserole. Okay. Cool. Um, or like butter beans or something. I'll I'll grab some of that. But the staples like a must have: turkey gravy, macaroni and cheese, and some dressing. But not a ton of dressing. Yeah. It's really good. Man. Uh, West one. Yeah. Dude, I love dressing. That's my yeah, favorite part. Um, That's your favorite. Okay. Yeah. My aunt cooks my um my grandma, God rest her soul. She has this recipe that's amazing. Mm. So my aunt cooks it every Thanksgiving. And I don't I'm a you know, some people don't let their food touch. I may let all my food touch to and make like, all mix, my food touch. Mix it together. Hell yeah. So I create my own personal um I would say stack. Mm-hmm. And <laughs> it starts out White rice on the bottom, mm. and then you put a big hunk of dressing on top of that, and then you put some turkey on top of that, then you pour gravy on top of the whole thing, and then you put just a little bit of cranberry sauce on top of that to sort of balance it and give it a little bit of sweet for the salty. And I'm out on that. So that's on my plate. Um, besides, Do you watch Friends? Yes. That sounds like the moist maker sandwich. Yeah, okay, so beside my... Um, Take on the moist maker sandwich, which I didn't know that's what it was, but macaroni and cheese beside that, uh, two deviled eggs. Oh um, yeah, yeah, deviled eggs. Yep. Broccoli deviled casserole, eggs. um, which is like broccoli and cheese and Ritz crackers and like tons of butter. I'm pretty Probably sure. Bacon. Lots. Um, no bacon on this. No bacon. But no. <laughs> Um, but that sounds good. Um, then maybe a little bit of corn, a little bit of green beans, but those are like literally just sort of if there's room on the plate. Just get a taste of them. Sweet yes. potato casserole. I mean, I'm, I'm, I left we don't that one out. Have that, yeah, I'm, I'm, I left I'm that one out. Fine yeah. with that. I like sweet potatoes. I like sweet potatoes now more than I used to. Um, it's a little desserty for me, honestly. I, I'll, I'll usually like bypass that and then just get dessert. So I'm definitely turkey, white or dark meat, like Will Muschamp. Doesn't really matter to me. Kind of prefer dark, but they're all good. Okay. Gravy, dressing, and so we do Thanksgiving lunch with my dad's side of the family. Thanksgiving dinner with my mom's side of the family, which is terrific because by Friday, I am completely constipated, um, and it's terrific. Um, but the the other great part is my dad's stepmom makes this beautiful sausage dressing, and she's amazing, by the way. She's like, she used to own a catering business here in Columbia. 
she studied at Cordon Bleu in London, so she's like, oh yeah, legit. She's got chops. Wow. So she has this sausage um, dressing that's sausage just dressing. incredible. That sounds awesome. And my other grandmother, and this is the part that I like because I'm all about variety and trying a bunch of different things. My other grandmother does a more cornbready kind of dressing, so I, I like you know getting to, getting the opportunity to experience each of those um, over the course of the afternoon, which is really nice. A little bit of corn, um, green beans or green bean casserole, whichever one is available. I think I think normally with my dad's side of the family, it's green bean casserole. And with my mom's side of the family, it's green beans. Um, what else? No deviled eggs for me. Sometimes a little bit of rice and some gravy on the rice. That's that's pretty much, I mean, I'll try everything. But that's like the foundation of, of what I like. And I'm like Wes. I, I like to mix it together. We get a, you know, a couple pieces like of that, that sweet, like cream corn, a little oh, bit of the yeah. turkey and the gravy, and definitely the cranberry sauce because again, you gotta have the gotta have like the tanginess to balance yeah. out all the like unctuous, like fatty umami of the turkey and the gravy. My brother sent me this on Instagram, and it's not totally gonna work here because it's a visual thing, but it's one of those like build your ideal Thanksgiving plate, like you know, build your ideal starting five. And the five dollar category is turkey, ham, and pumpkin pie. The four dollar category is stuffing, mashed potatoes, and rolls. Three dollars. Mac and cheese, sweet potatoes, green bean casserole, two dollars cranberry sauce, gravy, and cornbread, and one dollar is corn, pecan pie, and Brussels sprouts. So if I were to do it in the spirit of that, I'm going turkey, stuffing, green bean casserole, cranberry sauce, and pecan pie. See, I don't I don't like cranberry sauce. <laughs> nah, I can't do that. I I just get dessert for sweet. So yeah, let's what's what's dessert? I mean, obviously all of them, but if you could only eat one Thanksgiving dessert, pecan oh, pie. Pecan and pie. pie. Yeah, that'd be the one with ice cream. I like yeah. Um, my grandma makes this pecan pie that has chocolate chips in it. Oh, yes. I'm I'm there for that. Mm. Yeah, I'm usually pecan pie, but a little bit of everything. Every yeah. once in a while, like a, it's like a coconut cake or something will show up as like a wild card. I'm also going to try and make a Samoa's pie for this Thanksgiving, which hopefully will turn out well. I've heard of that. Coconut and yes. is that yeah. chocolate? Well, Samoa's like the, like the, the cookie, Girl Scout cookie. The cookie. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. That sounds, Saw it on sounds really good. Sounds really good. Yeah. So, how uh, is, how is macaroni and cheese only a three dollar thing? I mean, uh, that's oh yeah, like, and mac and cheese is on the plate as well. But you know what? To be honest, with rice and with mac and cheese, I I, I go easy because I don't want to fill up on the carbs because I want to I want more turkey. I mean, I guess the the dressing is like carby, but not as yeah. dense as like pasta or rice. And I just want to eat as much food as possible on Thanksgiving. So if I'm going to be, I guess, efficient with the space in my body, I need to I need to slow my roll on my mac and cheese and, and rice. Any other Thanksgiving thoughts? What's what's the most overrated Thanksgiving food, Wes? Since you wanted to mention that, uh, most overrated. I don't know, who, man. I like them all. Any veggies, though. I'm just <laughs> like to me. I, that's how I feel about the veggies. Um, is they're just taking up room hmm. that I could be shoving other things in there. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, like your that one dollar category had Brussels sprouts. Now I actually like Love Brussels, sprouts, Brussels sprouts, especially if done right. But I ain't eating them on Thanksgiving. Oh, really? That's yeah. like that's like one of my favorite foods once it gets cold. I eat Brussels sprouts every week during yep. cold season. That'll do it for us here, another Carolina podcast. For Wes, for Chris, I'm Pearson. Thank you all so much for listening. Rate, review, subscribe if you like it. There are going to be plenty more things going on. Um, obviously, we have a big recruiting season coming up with early signing period and then the actual you know national signing day and all that stuff. So there's plenty of stuff that we'll still keep doing, even though the football season is coming to an end on Saturday for South Carolina. Rate, review, subscribe, share it with your friends. All great ways to support the podcast. Thank you all so much for listening today and throughout the season. Hopefully you enjoy the game Saturday, and we will talk to you next week.